And now, the only survival show that survived three guys playing with barbed wire, unsupervised. In this episode, we sit down with Scooter to discuss how a surfer boy financial geek from L.A. became a Texas micro rancher, and how you can too. Howdy, and welcome to In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode 138. We're your hosts, Aaron and Jason, and you are in the rabbit hole, safe and sound. All right, let's rope and poke this goat. Scooter, (laughs) welcome to the show, man. Hey, guys. Speaking of roping things, I know we totally roped you into this, and you were like, you guys want me to do what? But uh, but I do want to say <laughs> I really appreciate you you coming on today, because what you're doing is actually really interesting. I mean, it's so interesting you managed to uh, to wrangle Jason into your shenanigans. <laughs> I, I basically blackmailed him. Yes, yes, that was it. Well, you had pictures of him with that cow. Uh, and, well, uh, exactly. Yes. So, <laughs> and that goat, and that, you know. All right. Well, we'll, leave. well great. This, we'll, is, this is going to be a pick on Jason show. All it right, is going to be a pick on, on Jason on. show. So now, Scooter, we're going to talk about micro ranching today. But to back up for a minute so that people understand just how crazy we're going to get today. What do you do for a living exactly? So I work at uh, one of the major oil and gas companies here in Houston uh, with our uh, energy technologies group, which is the guys that kind of help figure out where the oil is. And I'm actually just a finance we there. I'm, uh, you know, uh, as far as ways as you could get uh, from anything to do with ranching in my day job. <laughs> <laughs> so take us back but, in time. But he's got the truck and he's got the boots. Well, you know, I he's got the truck, <laughs> boots, and gun. And those are, like, as soon as you come to Texas, it's like, oh, you're from California? Here, you're going to need some a truck, well, it some was, boots, it and It was issued to me. When I was exactly. at the DMV getting my license, um, they, they gave me my kit. And so that that was included in the kit. The yeah. Porsche went away. The truck came in, and, and there I was. <laughs> yeah, except he shoots a Beretta. It's a ninety-two F. It's an okay gun. I'm I'm not a huge fan of, but well, you know what? At the end of the day, they are tanks. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa! I thought there was no judging on this show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm with you, Scooter. I'm I'm with you. It's Jason over there judging. I've got to make up for the fact that I drive a, a little hatchback, and I'm out there at the ranch. <laughs> stuff out of a hatchback. <laughs> it's okay. It's and red. That like, still yeah. cracks me up. By the way, <laughs> seeing Jason get out of that car is like if you've ever been to a Barlow and Bailey show where the clowns are getting out of the DW bus. Yes, it's it's a similar type of experience. You're like, oh my gosh, more is coming out of the truck. Out of the car, <laughs> out of the so back us up in time. Where where are you from originally? So I'm from uh, Los Angeles. Yeah, the city of Angels out in California, uh, beach boy, grew up surfing, you know, all that. And uh, most recently moved here from San Francisco. I thought you were a little light in cowboy boots. It kind of explains it. Hey, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's going to be that kind of show today. Oh, so yeah. I was rubbing on hairy arms earlier. Yeah. Where? Well, that was because we had to share a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so we have... A Jewish financial geek cowboy from Los Angeles. How did you get into micro ranching? Now, hold on for just a second. Before we hear that answer, a quick message. Help us keep the lights on. Support the ITRH show and mission by becoming part of the Roving Horde Armada. You can learn more at ITRH.net about all the great benefits membership gets you. Things like encrypted forums to connect with like-minded people. Access to every episode ever produced by ITRH, including a special one never aired. A free copy of the book Owning Your Survival, Nine Steps for Surviving, Survival, and Preparedness. Access to a one-hour emergency kits for bugging out and bugging in class with special downloads, just to name a few of the great benefits. Again, visit ITRH.net for more details now. We're counting on supporting members just like you. Now back to Scooter and Micro Ranching. Well, I mean, it's a journey, really. It started sometime back when I was doing a a fair bit of reading, uh, 
from folks like Michael Pollan and Joe Saladin, folks that are doing, you know, polyculture farming and things like that. So just reading up on that, really wanting to understand my food source and, hey, where does this food come from? I mean, I, I think a ton of Americans go to the supermarket, pick up some meat, and have no idea where it came from, don't know the rancher, don't know the source, don't realize how many entities are involved in that supply chain between the actual animal and their dinner. And it's actually startling, at least for me it was, reading up on it and going, oh my goodness, there's there's a lot of hands in that pie before it gets to me, and, and what can I do to kind of shorten the steps between me and, and my dinner, frankly? My first step or my first foyer into this was really getting in on a on a steer out in California, not owning any land, not wanting to own any land, but saying, well, geez, isn't the simplest thing I could do is just buying a steer, going in with some friends, taking my quarter of that steer, having it delivered to me when the steer was ready for harvesting, and knowing, you know, eating in good conscience, knowing the rancher that helped raise the steer. It's a really interesting and simple arrangement. You just basically, you know, met this rancher through friends of friends, went out to his ranch and agreed on a per pound, you know, carcass weight price for his heifer. That was my heifer, so it was that exact one. He, you know, got him to the target weight that he needed to get to when he was ready for harvesting. And a few months later, lo and behold, dinner was served. It was a really neat way and a lot more easy than I thought. I'm like, wow, I, I really don't need these, um, you know, three or four governmental agencies and God knows how many middlemen and, and so forth gave me that saran wrapped package steak. I could probably cut all those folks out and just deal with the rancher directly. So that was really kind of me getting my, my toe in the water on eating in good conscience and understanding our food sources. And so you... You progressed from there, though. I mean, you went further down the rabbit hole, if you'll pardon the pun, and got much deeper into it. But before we get to that, there is a really funny story you were telling us recently, and it does have to do with self-sufficiency. You were at a prison recently. (laughs) If I could interrupt, I just want to clarify, I was visiting a prison. (laughs) I was not actually... I guess that's the prison, if you will. Oh, oh, oh. I, I'm sorry. I thought you were there for, like, conjugal visits or something. Yeah. No, no, no. Bubba <laughs> was busy that weekend. <laughs> so, yeah, I had the opportunity, me and some friends, to road trip it out to Angola Prison uh, out in central Louisiana. If you've, if you've never been to the prison rodeo out there, this is a rodeo event that they had out there, but just visiting the prison in general... It is well worth uh, the trip out there. It's you know, probably about a six, seven hour drive from Houston, but it is in uh, what was a farming prison for the last you know hundred years or so. And these folks have set up an entire city, a farm city, prison city rather, all run by prisoners. They have their own horse breeding program. They grow their own meat there. They have dairy farms. They have farming and everything else. I'm sure they're not 100% self-sufficient, but they are pretty close to it. And it's all been organized through the Louisiana prison system. It's been in place for, you know, in excess of like 80, 90, 100 years. So it's really, really interesting just to see how um, something like that has been set up for a while back. And here we are 100 years later, and, and the system and the process they put in place is doing pretty well. So might be some lessons learned in there. I know, you know, we don't think it's prisons as models for things like that, but that might be an interest, interesting case to study. Very short side, John. It makes you wonder why more prisons aren't set up that way, to be self-sufficient. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. I think it's one of those things that, you know, as a society, everyone thinks of prisons in terms of just giving them a TV room and a cell and a climate-controlled environment. And this this was not that. This was the opposite of that, which is, hey, they're going to go ahead and kind of fend for themselves. And frankly, I, I, I'm, I'm no psychologist, but I would think that in terms of if you wanted to rehabilitate someone and give them some useful skills and or at least give them something meaningful to do other than cook up plots in their cells, you send them out to work. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there, but an interesting model, and, and wow, wouldn't it be neat if more of them or more models like that could be replicated elsewhere in the state? Yeah, absolutely. Man, that is some fascinating stuff. Now, to wrap out this story a little bit, you were also telling us about the rodeo itself, and really, I just want this story because it was just hysterical to, to hear about. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about it, your it, experience with the rodeo itself. 
it, it was amazing. It was, as the warden would say, the wildest show in the West. You know what? He, he is not uh, overselling the show at all. It is probably what rodeos were 50 years ago in terms of significantly less structure, if you will. <laughs> A lot of wild animals. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. It, it kind of harkens to the days of the Coliseum where we have man versus beast and jeering crowds. And I was out there, of course, in my toga, giving them the thumbs down. But it was <laughs> it was a really, really you know wild show in terms of what these folks were doing with these inmates, all volunteers, to you know jump in. And, and not just your standard bull riding. They had, for example, convicts poker, which is a fascinating game. <laughs> they have four convicts <laughs> sitting down at a poker table, and uh, they release a wild bull. <laughs> and so long as you don't move, you're okay because the bull will think you're part of the series. But if you so much as bat an eye, the bull's going to kind of mow you down. It's the last guy sitting in his chair unmoved that wins that competition while his compadres are getting tossed around like rag dolls by this wild bull. Yeah, it's pretty neat. To reiterate, this was totally voluntary. It's these guys were volunteering to do this, assuming because it's entertainment for them and it's something different and out of the ordinary for them oh yeah no absolutely and there's a long course i just i think someone did a film on it called six seconds of freedom or or something along those lines where it talks and he interviewed quite a few of the inmates on why they do it and so forth and for them they, they say it's just that it's their moment to feel free again it's their moment to, to do something more than be a convict and an inmate so that kind of resonated with me and and i'm like wow this is this is great to support this group and, and these guys in their community that they're self-sustaining, despite the fact that these guys are convicts and prisoners, they they still kind of really manage this wonderful existence. I mean, as far as prison life can go. And so I'm happy to support that. Happy to go to the show. Highly recommend it. And, and, you know, as an aside, a lot of the prisoners there actually have art. They uh, are allowed to sell. So they make various bits of prison art that they then sell. And then the money goes back into the program. And I think, a prisoner gets to keep a portion of that, but they have to pay for all their own art supplies and so forth. So again, with the mantra of so long as it pays for itself, you're okay doing it. So mm -hmm. really, really, you know, like what the warden has done out there. Not that I know a whole lot about prison systems, but I really wish all of them were run that way. That's, that's pretty amazing. And I mean, that's why I wanted to include it today, even though it's, it, it is part of your journey, but I just thought it was so interesting. I wanted to get that into the show today. And one hell of a journey. Step back for just a second. Here's Surfer Boy, migrated to Texas through San Francisco, and now he's out watching like gladiator prison gladiator games. Yeah, yeah that's, that's that's an evolution. Yeah, it definitely is. To circle back to the cows and uh, the micro ranching, the main focus of the of the day. So this topic really does speak to a lot of people that are in. Because so many people that are in preparedness and survival are also super big fans of Joe Saladin's and are big into sustainability and self-sufficiency. And I think cows and micro ranching is something that most people probably have never thought of before. The idea of owning cattle and getting into ranching without even really necessarily fully knowing what they're doing just seems like such a farce. I think it seems like one of those things that it's this far off dream that one day I'll own land and one day I'll have cattle. But now you've proven that to not be the case. You, you've actually turned that on its head, which is really cool. So how does it work? Because you started off with no land. No, absolutely. And, that, and that's what I'd have to say is, firstly, just to connect the dots on this, is, is survivability and sustainability, in my mind, they go hand in hand. I'm more about, you know, good conscience and understanding the, your food and, and the sustainable element of it. But that absolutely translates into, wow, self-sufficiency. The two are very tightly linked, right? Mm. To your point, it really was baby steps through it. And you don't have to make this big leap of, oh, goodness, I need to get 100 acres and I've got to get all this expensive equipment and, and tractors and this and that. And mathematically, it doesn't really pan out unless I've got 100 head of cattle. So it, it sounds like you really have to do that for a living. And I submit that's not the case. At least for me, it wasn't. I started out by literally leasing land. So uh, I had no equipment, no cattle, no anything. I had a really good friend of the family that, that hooked me up, um, was able to get me my first two heifers, uh, which are butler longhorns here in Texas. I literally had to run around and find a place for these girls. So I kind of did it backwards, I'll admit. 
but I, I, you know, I didn't right away say, oh, I need to go buy something because I wanted to take my time and, and kind of find the right thing and really understand what the heck it was I was doing, but rather say, you know, do, does someone know someone who's got some land where I can park these cattle? And what I found was not, not only did I get through just a network friend, right? So it was actually my, my former secretary's, follow me on this, my former secretary's <laughs> mom's fiance's land. So fancy you that. So <laughs> you'd, you'd be surprised who can help you out. Had some land and he wasn't doing, you know, anything with it yet. He's still a year out at that point from retiring it and was just kind of getting it ready and was not ready to have cattle on it himself. And so we struck a deal and it was actually economically very, very easy to do. But what I found out later is, is that that's not actually very uncommon. Uh, talking right. to other folks, talking to the neighbor right across the way there, it was easy to see that other people have sections of land or some fallow land. And so if, if you're able to just through friends, families, networks, meeting people, it's not that hard to find a patch of dirt for your animals. So you know, to all your listeners, I would say that, that are thinking about this or saying, well, I don't know, and they're, they're sitting there sharpening their pencils trying to map out this big, huge operation, I'd submit you don't need to go that far. You, you can dip your toe in the water by finding some land, securing a 12 or 24 or 36-month lease, getting just a handful of, of heifers to start you out, and start applying the trade, start getting involved, start learning the process and say, wow, okay, some things are hard, some things are not as hard as I thought it would be. Don't be intimidated by um, trying to, to jump into a whole new big capital intensive program. That's really not the case, at least not for me. You mentioned capital a few times, and that's something I want to come back to in a second. But before we get to that, how did you go about learning about cattle and cattle management and, and all that fun stuff? Did you just pick up books or did you find a mentor or a little bit of both. So uh, definitely reading. There's just a bevy of material out there. There's a lot of really great literature. Most of the authors that I've read, specific around ranching, have been Texas authors. A, because there's a preponderance of, of literature out there that's written through, say, a and Ag Extension and other ranchers that have taken the time to write some, some how-tos on these. So lots of great material. And, and B, it was nice to get in touch with local folks and learn from them, talking literally to my rancher's neighbor and their friends, and then meeting people like Jason, who maybe didn't have a bevy of information, but, but was not lacking in enthusiasm. And so <laughs> kind of learning it together and learning on the job as you would anything else that you're, you know, you experiment with. And so learning by doing as well. Yeah, all you had to do was tell Jason there were barred yarn animals involved. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't keep his hands off him. Exactly. See, that. this is exactly how he wrote me in. He got over the biggest hurdle that most normal people that don't have those kind of connections are afraid of. And it's that putting those two pieces together, that, that getting some cows and finding lease land. All actuality, it's really, really easy. It's really not that hard at all. It's just you have to get out there and get your hands dirty a little bit. And then all of a sudden, doors open. Yeah. It's not like our shenanigans with rabbits and no right, water. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which we did all the wrong way. But yeah, and I think we haven't had a chance to really catch people up on that yet. That mm -hmm. This is your new, your new adventure. And those were the pictures of you. Well, us, I should say, but they were of you. And we were out fooling around with the barbed wire and learning all the wonders that is working with barbed wire. Because I'd never, <laughs> I worked right. with horses. I rode very extensively as a, as a kid on into my teens. And so, you know, with horses, you never really deal with, with barbed wire. For me, it was a new and exciting adventure of pain and torture. Uh, <laughs> and you too. So yes, it was, yes. it was quite interesting, but that this is your, your latest adventure Yeah, and um, is getting into the, the ranching. Oh, I wanted to expand a little bit larger animal. <laughs> you succeeded. That, that is a larger animal. Jason. It's all thanks to scooter. Yes. yes. So circling back to the financial piece of this, how does this actually work out? I mean, you're a financial guy. How, do, how does this work on paper? Having one or even a couple head of cattle and leasing some land and stuff that it makes any financial sense at all? Oh, absolutely. Even on the smallest scale. And again, you're, you know, you're not doing it as a commercial operation. At least I'm not. So I'm not laser focused on saying, wow, how can I make six figures by selling beef? That wasn't it at all. It was more, hey, how can I really get a nice, you know, great steak that I know where it came from, that I made myself, that truly is mine, and 
I have a freezer full of meat in my garage, regardless of what happens. That's always kind of a neat thing to do. So, so economically, getting into the first couple of heifers, especially if you're getting you know smaller girls or yearlings, is actually not that expensive. Beef has gone up recently in the last probably year or so. So it's probably a little bit more expensive than it would have been, you know, 18 months ago. But it's relatively cheap uh, to get into some yearling heifers. The the lease that I'm in right now is, is basically free. I mean, it really is really cheap. A lot of ranchers out there, even folks that aren't really ranching, they may just have a, a hay operation or something like that, really could benefit from your cows being on their land so that they get the ag exemption. This win-win potential, if you find a patch of land or a farmer that's looking to get an ag exemption or maintain the ag exemption, and you put your cattle on their land, they win from tax perspective, and you win because you get a place, a grazing lease for, for next to nothing. As a rough math, and you know, depending on where you look, and this month I actually went on a few other websites to see if I was the only one doing this, and if I stumbled into something truly amazing, now lo and behold, a lot of people are doing this. And it's anywhere from you know about 75 bucks per head per cow to have someone put graze basically your cattle on their land. I got something a little bit cheaper than that just because I knew this guy, but long and the short of it, I mean, you're talking about a few hundred dollars a year to to get grazing uh, rights. So, you know, vis-a-vis the figure most of us have in, in our heads, which is, oh boy, I need a million bucks or I need a half a million dollars. It's like, no, actually you need a couple grand. It's a much smaller number than that. If somebody wanted to, if they were looking to get into this professionally, and I, actually, I don't even know if... We may go there for a second. Is that the road that you're trying to go to with your life? Is actually you want to become a rancher? I don't know yet. I don't know yet. It would be a dream at some point to be completely self-sustained to where I could. I could have that option. Um, but I have my career. I have my job. And so for the today, I'm, I'm okay with this not being my primary income source. Would it be great if it was someday? Absolutely. But I recognize that to be a journey. Then again, if you would have asked me 10 years ago what I'd be doing today, there's no way I would have said, oh, I'm being used to working in oil and gas. Who knows what the future may bring? So that might change things in the next 10 years. Yeah, that's the overall plan is a 10-year plan, huh? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's see where we could take this in the next 10 years. At what point, maybe you know, maybe you don't, I don't know how deeply you've looked into this yet, but at what, at what number of head of cattle financial outlay can someone actually, when does it actually become financially viable? I think you hit on a great point, which is, you know, it depends what your needs are. Uh, I have an extravagant lifestyle. Jason can attest to this. <laughs> so my needs are very high. He's single. Uh, however, if you really want to embrace the lifestyle, it's a very, very, very different story. You, you start to realize there are things that just become less important to you. And so I think you start focusing on, well, what do I really need to live and so forth? And the other element of it is there's so many permutations of this, right? So I've got buffalo longhorns. They're slow growers but they're very hardy. I chose them specifically because they are very hardy. And frankly, I wanted an animal that I couldn't kill. And so uh, (laughs) vis-a-vis some of the other breeds that are probably a little bit more sensitive, a little bit more high maintenance, but significantly more profitable. And Jason's done some research in this area as well, but there's definitely, you know, if you want to go to the uber high-end stuff, there are cuts of meat that will fetch retail prices of $65 a pound which I find borderline offensive, but lo and behold, people are buying it on a regular basis. Yeah. And you can go all the way down to commercial beef, which is, you know, three, four bucks a pound. Different models. So I, I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to answer how many cows because it really depends how, what your needs are and how you want to take this. But you could definitely still be very profitable with a very small number of high-end specialized cows. Or if you just want to do a run-of-the-mill commercial beef operation and do something a little bit more low maintenance in terms of the actual cattle, you're going to need to have obviously a few more, a few more head of cattle to make that economically viable for you. And aren't there? There's three different basically business plans for a ranch. There's the calf cow thing, then there's the starter calves, and then meat production, and then there's the show thing, right? Right. And there's also finishing, right? So there's a few different models as well. The cow calf is probably a little bit more complex. I'd shy away from that for maybe someone that's brand, brand new into it because of course it deals with cow uh animals and that's where there's a lot more complexity involved. The, uh, the finishing uh, one is an interesting operation. And from what I've read, that's the easiest, if you will. 
for folks just starting out and that you've got an animal that's already a year old or older, so the, the risks tend to be a lot lower, and you're just literally letting it graze till it's ready to harvest. And the in-between is kind of what Jason and I are playing around with, which is a yearling animal that's ready for breeding. We're going to try to breed it and, and hopefully not completely screw things up. <laughs> right. Now, that's interesting. And you were saying you, you wanted one that was hard to kill. I, and I've actually yeah, heard oh, I've, that. Yeah, I've tried. I have tried, and the girls are still alive. <laughs> I don't want to know what you were doing to try to kill your cows, but I've heard that cows can actually be, like, in some cases, it's almost like they want to kill themselves. Them and sheep. Oh, yeah. So More so sheep. More so sheep, yes. yeah. How does that work out? You know, you've got your longhorn and you've got your other temperaments, but, I mean, is that a misnomer or is that true? Like, some cows are just, like, just, like you could swear they're trying to kill themselves. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Long, longhorns are the pit bulls of the cattle world. Uh, they're, they're survivors, as far as that goes. And so we, um, in our infant wisdom, we had that storm kind of blow through, and we kind of forgot that the cows have no shelter <laughs> out there. And so there's, you know, rain and hail and lightning, the whole nine years, the uprooted oak trees on the ranch. hundred years old. And I, I go there after the storm, and the, and the cows are just munching away like, like nothing's happened. Despite the fact that they should have probably been picked up and swept away, they seem to be just fine, uh, regardless of what we throw at them. <laughs> Honest to God, man. Honest to God. I'm, I'm, like, like, I'm like hearing God, the, they're not dead. I'm oh. hearing the Wizard of Oz song in my head, like picture cows swirling <laughs> or what was that tornado chasing movie? Whatever. Yeah. Well, let's go down to what do you look for in a good heifer? <laughs> Horns. <laughs> no, um, so so no balls. I, I am I exactly no 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 balls. That's that's step one. No, in all seriousness, bulls scare the crap out of me. I uh, I am not ready to undertake handling a bull anytime soon. They are big animals. People don't realize you have to have a healthy respect for these beasts because they are you yes. know bulls get well in excess of fifteen hundred pounds. And they can run a hell of a lot faster than I could. So mm, I don't been, feel like being chased around by a Hyundai. And that's basically what it is. I have and been so, chased by one before. I will tell you, it is not a pleasant experience. <laughs> Hyundai or a bull? Both. Yeah. Uh, no, that was a BMW. Uh, all right. <laughs> no, bull. I've been chased by a bull once before. It was, uh, I, I will tell you, it, it will, um, it'll make you beat feet faster than you ever thought you could before. Exactly. And actually, in all seriousness, so the friend of the family that, that helped me out with these first two heifers or whatnot, he actually had a ranch and get gouged by a bull. And the guy lived, everything is okay, but it's one of those things that even professionals that do this for a living, you really, really have to respect the animal. And so uh, for now, uh, I'm sticking to heifers. Uh, we're going to, Jason's going to help me inseminate them. And what I mean by that <laughs> is take them down to A&M for artificial insemination. So mm -hmm. we're not, we're going to kind of probably keep a bull out of the picture for the time being. Yes. Anyway. Y'all are going to, we, we've got enough nuts. We don't need uh, you know another pair. Okay. So <laughs> going back to what you're looking for in a heifer, tell us what you look for in a heifer. Well, right now it's just the breeds more than anything else. Beyond that, it's the reputation of the farmer or the rancher from whom you're buying the heifer. I'd say that's kind of the most critical thing until you have enough experience. And I know I have none uh, in terms of seeing what a good animal is, what a bad animal is. You're not going to know. You're really, at the end of the day, putting a lot of trust and, and putting yourself at the mercy of the person selling the heifer. So for now, I'm staying away from things like auctions and, and so forth, where they're literally just sold by the pound and you don't really know the rancher and so forth and doing everything through networking. So as we look at adding to the herd and growing the herd and so forth, really, really important to understand the source of your heifers as much as the heifers themselves. When you're ready, to have the heifer processed, do you just take that to, is, is it like a, a processing place you take it to, or how does that work? It's great when you don't actually have to sell it. So the minute you sell beef to someone else, beyond friends and family type of thing, but actually commercially sell it, the FDA gets involved. Right. And the minute it's an FDA, it has to go through an FDA-approved facility. Well, of course, once it's an FDA-approved facility, half the time the folks that fill it are unionized and they have all their union rules, not knocking unions, but I'm just saying they have all their rules and you've got to have so many bathrooms and max breaks and this and that. So all I have to say is the, the price kind of starts to go up quite a bit because now you've got all these rules and regulations and inspectors and other people involved that kind of have nothing to do with your effort, 
but end up adding to the cost of processing that animal. Mm. However, if it is for personal consumption, and personal consumption is pretty vaguely defined, it's not that I alone have to eat the animal per se, as much as I'm just not commercially marketing it to HEB, let's say. I'm not commercially marketing it to the public. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have to go through FDA uh, approval. They have smaller slaughterhouses that will handle this that are more like community or private or ones that are, so let's say like Burton Sausage Company, I believe has one as well, that is kind of dedicated slaughter and they'll take someone else's on the side and you pay them a substantially lower rate than if you did if you had to go to an FDA approved facility. Yeah, so that makes it's just sense. A, it's just a different ball of wax and it's wonderful. You put your, your cutting orders in, you get the animal carved up exactly the way you want it. You want more ground, less ground, thicker steaks, this cut, that cut. And so uh, really, really kind of just opens for, for you foodies out there, opens up the possibilities of all these other cuts of meat that you're just not going to find at HEB. Hmm. That makes sense. We used something similar to that to have our deer processed. The, the one thing about beef is it's a huge animal. Yeah. I mean, you have to have the equipment to do this. Yeah. It's not like I can go out there with my little, you know, skin and knife and, you know, and cut, no. you know break this thing down. It's just too damn big. Yeah. So now here's a, a totally random thing. And this circles back to what we were talking about earlier about financial and equipment involved and stuff like that. When I was out on the property, I noticed you didn't have a trailer. You don't have one, do you? No, I sure don't. I, I have a GPS, and they're good on a leash. They're leash trained, so they just just follow me. Oh, nice, no. nice. Okay, <laughs> remote control cows. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That's it. No, no. I mean, and I, I'll joking aside with again with these longhorn breeds. I don't need to take them anywhere. They don't need to go to the vet. Well, actually, a lot of times the vets come out to you, to be honest. And and these gals, uh, you know, realistically, they're set for breeding, so it's a little bit different. But if they were going to be harvested, there's kind of only one trailer ride they need to go on, and that's kind of their last one. Mm -hmm. For the most part, you don't you don't really need to move them around that much. The good news is, and, and I guess we'll get into this in a bit, is I'm actually in process of uh, purchasing some land, and this land has an abandoned horse trailer on it, which I think if we fix it up, might be serviceable enough so that we can transport a couple of these girls anyway mm -hmm. uh, from their previous location to the new location. So how have you been transporting them? Haven't needed to yet. So these girls were delivered by the rancher. You know, obviously we're not slaughtering these yet, but when we need to get them to A&M, we'll be able to use this trailer. But I've already met some people in the community and getting a hand on a trailer to borrow someone's trailer, to lease someone's trailer, to rent someone's trailer is, is not the end of the world. So again, you know, going back to, oh, geez, I need to buy a tractor and a trailer and this and that. It's like, hmm. I don't know that you need it. I think you need it eventually as you get into it, but you don't need it all at once. You can kind of beg, borrow, and steal for at least the fair, you know, first bit for the first year or two and slowly acquire the equipment as you need it or come across it mm -hmm. and or buy used equipment. I mean, there's there's a lot of avenues out there that, that help keep your cattle capital costs or your startup costs pretty low to start with so you're not dumping a bunch of money from day one. That's pretty cool. And I think the other thing is, with our farm, with the rabbits and the watering system and everything else, it actually did, not just the rabbits, when we had basically 40 rabbits and 40 chickens and we were constructing a water system and all this other stuff, it was extremely time consuming. I mean, they're, yeah. you know, they were small animals, so it, it required a lot of, I don't want to say intricate infrastructure, but it was definitely infrastructure that required a lot of work and there was a tremendous amount of cleanup. But you were saying the other day, these cows really don't take you much time. No, no, they really don't. These girls are pretty self-sustaining. Now, obviously, there's you know some setup investment that you need to do in terms of getting your fences, going to perimeter fences and, and things like that. And, and you guys get to experience some of that when you play with your barbed wire. <laughs> I also set up some monkeyed around with the electric fence for a while. That was fun. It's a miracle I didn't barbecue myself <laughs> trying to get that set up. But pretty front loaded. It was, it was a few weekends in there just getting everything set up. But once you set that up, and again, cattle are a lot easier than, you know, smaller animals like chickens and so forth, where it seems like the wind blows and one of them knocks over dead. Pretty much. Uh, so these gals are, are pretty much, it's, it's almost like winding the clock. You kind of do all the work up front, and then you stand back and watch. And so there's a lot of that going on. I would say I'm out right now. I'm out there maybe twice a month. I think, Jason, you had out there, what, about once or twice a month? Yep. 
And when I say out there, it's going out there, having lunch, making sure they're still alive, and then getting back in my truck. So it's not yeah. that I'm even working a lot when I'm out there as much as just enjoying the scenery and then coming home. Luckily, that drive is really, really pretty. It's a nice, windy it's drive. It's a beautiful drive. Yeah. When I went to go meet Jason out there to help him out with the bob wire, I listened to, it was great. Like I was listening to a book on the way and it was, you know, beautiful Texas countryside. And it's like, man, I need some land <laughs> and a cow. It, it definitely makes, it, it starts giving the itch. Definitely. It does. It definitely does. So what, there's a lot of great programs too, in terms of, uh, and I haven't even scratched the surface on some of these in terms of financial assistance that you can get through various things. Uh, I know Texas BLB veterans land board, does for veterans does low interest kind of low down payment type loans specifically for land not for homes not for you know buying a new Maserati but for buying patches of dirt uh, so there's there's a, quite a few programs out there that are worth investigating if you're if you're looking to get into it oh that's cool I mean do you have them off the top of your head you can share with us like some of them well, I know there's one from the USDA. I don't know how that works. I do know the BLB one very well because I almost used it for, for something, which basically at a high level, they guarantee a loan for, I think it's $125,000. You only have to come up with, I think it's 3%. Uh, so very, very, again, you know, not, not one of these half million dollar deals, but uh, three or four grand gets you started. They'll guarantee the rest of the loan, uh, which is great for land loans only anyway. And they write a pretty competitive uh, interest rate for a 20-year note on the land. So, And and quite a few. In fact, the person from whom I'm buying this land on on a future ranch here actually purchased the land through a VLB loan uh, back in the day. And the USDA stuff is their grants. And they've got – I mean, I went through the entire list. There was about 20 or 30 different grants that they have. You have to really sit down and read them and really kind of go through them. It's not – it's not like filling out a little application. It's you're kind of like submitting an essay almost. Yeah, I mean, it's like any grant for anything, whether it's college or you know, dumping a mm-hmm. couple tons of sea monkeys into the ocean. I mean, there's a lot of paperwork that has to go into it. Right, right. But it it's there. I mean, and it's free money. Yeah. So hey, yeah, might as well. Well, that's really cool, man. So when did you first figure out Jason was was a huge sucker and you could get him into this and get him to do all the <laughs> manual labor? Well, when I told him uh, that I was getting these heifers and this and that, and I, I can't remember where we were, if you were at my house, Jason, if we were at a bar, but I, I'm not for sure. I thought you crapped yourself. <laughs> so I, I literally, I was like sniffing. I'm like, did he just poop himself? So I, I kind of knew at that point, I'm like, wow, this guy, this guy's all in. <laughs> you just basically like brought up, oh, my dream presented it like, oh, it, you just do this, this, and this, and it, it's all done. I'm like... Um, can I ride your coattails? <laughs> How'd you do that again? So is this your last stop on the knowing where your food comes from sustainability? Do you have other plans going forward or are you just going to stick with cows for the time being? So for the time being cows and, and potentially donkeys, that's a whole other story. We won't talk about that in this episode, uh, but donkeys might somehow be involved. Donkey show. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't help. Go ahead. <laughs> which, only, which only people from Texas would understand what that means, but continue. <laughs> but uh, no, for now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start off with the cows uh, initially. Where uh, I go with, I mean, with you know the going to be a goat in here, right? You know there's going to be a goat in here, right? Yeah, there's, there's probably going to be a goat or two, but that's more because we need a, basically a, a groundskeeper, right? That's what goats <laughs> right, do. Right. They keep the weeds out of control. Get a Scottish so ones you can call him groundskeeper Willie. Uh, really? uh, actually, that is a really good name, Willie the Groundskeeper. I yeah. like that. There I like you that go. a lot. There you go. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's awesome. I'll never eat this damn thing. Goat? Yeah. Oh, cabrito, dude. Oh, hell no, yeah. No, I was saying, why would you eat the goat? Goats are... Just goats good. Don't eat your lawnmower, man. Anyway, Scooter, I sure appreciate having you on today, and this is really fascinating. I want to have you on some more this season and kind of follow y'all's adventures and and hear how this goes and uh hopefully you don't let jason injure himself too bad because he and i have a uh, tendency to do that <laughs> so I, I make no promises uh, i will say we should probably get an over and under on what are the odds of 
Jason and I not killing one of the heifers by year end. I don't, I don't know if you want to keep a running tab somewhere on your website, see what the odds are, how many people vote against or for it. But so far, we've been, what, four months, Jason? Yeah. And, and they're both alive. All right, all right. I think we're gonna, gonna have a betting pool going on here. So we'll see. Uh, I'll have to... <laughs> I'll have He's to gonna put this up on the, on the site. I am going to put this up. I will have to think of what the prize is for the person who who wins. So it'll have to be something uh, something cool. But uh, but yeah, again, man, I sure appreciate you you spending the time with us today to to share with us, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about these adventures. Great, hey, great talking to you guys today, and and thanks everyone for uh, taking a listen. Resources from today's episode. And the ability to comment on this episode will be available at www.intherabbithole.com slash E138. Be sure to tune in next week. I sit down with author Lauren Wilson of Eating Through the Zombie Apocalypse. She's going to share lessons with us about defending yourself against wild turkey attacks and goat ranching. And don't forget, help us keep the lights on. Support the ITRH show and mission by becoming part of the Roving Horde Armada. You can learn more at ITRH.net about all the great benefits membership gets you. Things like encrypted forums to connect with like-minded people, access to every episode ever produced by ITRH, including a special one never aired, a free copy of the book Owning Your Survival, Nine Steps for Surviving, Survival, and Preparedness. Access to a one-hour emergency kits for bugging out and bugging in class with special downloads. Just to name a few of the great benefits. Again, visit itrh.net for more details now. We're counting on supporting members just like you. From the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound. Westwood.